Hi, this is Pat Moorhead, and we are live at IBM Think 2023. Big news, big discussions are it, AI. I mean, AI is pretty much everywhere. Not that, you know, the hybrid cloud wasn't important, but it's all about AI this week. Well, Pat, I think we're all seeing where this is heading. And so over the last uh, few years, we've seen all the development yeah. with hybrid cloud, you know, that Red Hat acquisition for IBM has really come into conscious of how big and important it's going to be, and now we're seeing what's going to get built on top of it, and that is, in fact, AI. Super exciting, and we're here for a 6.5 Insider, but hey, let's introduce our guest, Rob, Dario, great to see you again. Nice to see you, I feel you, like it's been a, a threefer. You've been very generous with your time with the industry analysts, saw you both on the big stage, but things are really happening here at the show, and it's super exciting, and by the way, there were no doubts in my mind that uh, IBM was going to show up big with generative AI. It's not like you haven't been working on it for years and years and years, but uh, love the perspective that you bring and welcome to the 6.5 Insider. Thank you for having us, really glad you guys are here. And it's been an amazing, I'd say past few years, but if you think about our history with Watson, it goes back nearly 13 years. Right. I think we learned a lot in the era around machine learning, deep learning, it was really hard. You spend a lot of time annotating data. Some things are successful, some things are not. Right. Dario and I started the work, I guess, 2020, a little bit before that on foundational models. And we saw that this is something that could really make AI more accessible. Right. And so it's pretty exciting now to <laughs> be presenting this to the world and giving everybody a sense of where we're going. Yeah, Sorry. you know, that, that uh, brings up a really good question for you guys. At least I think it's going to be a good question. I don't know. We'll see. If <laughs> so we'll Self-attribution <laughs> early and often in this in this uh, in this episode, Pat. But uh, you know, AI is the top of everyone's mind right now. You know, over the last six months, it went from something I think that people were starting to feel into their lives in little ways to something that's right out in front of you. I think you could talk about whether that's ChatGPT. You could talk about kind of the AI arms race that's going on. But that's a lot of kind of out front consumer stuff. The enterprise hasn't necessarily been addressed as much, but I feel like it was really addressed here at Think. Talk a little bit, Rob, about how this moment, this inflection, is also really, really big for the enterprise. I mean, to the credit of OpenAI, they did inspire a lot of interest in this topic. Since that's happened though, every CEO I talk to, the question is, we're unsure of what to do. So we're convinced there's something here, but how do we do this in a way that it's going to have a positive impact for our business? We can avoid any of the pitfalls that get written about frequently. Our focus with Watson X and what we've announced this week is how do we deliver something that's trusted, right. that's scalable, that's adaptable. And part of the adaptable piece is we have IBM models. Dario will talk a little bit about the models that we've built, how they can be utilized, but we also want to be open with clients and say, yeah. you can build your own model, you can work with open source models. I think this is going to be the key for how businesses start to adopt generative AI and foundation models. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that that element of the strategy is really important. If you look under Watson X, the platform has been very carefully thought through to do the AI piece of right. training, validating, tuning, and then doing inference right at the moment of deployment. But what is the data store associated with enabling you to build the data piles that are necessary to be able to train those models or fine tune those models? And then the governance framework. How do you have a, an end-to-end -end life cycle management of the models? Because as we know in this field, the job is never done, right. right? You have a family of models, you have it, and then what happens? You have either new data that you want to incorporate, maybe some data you are using, you no longer want to have in the training set, right? Or there's a new regulatory framework that allows you to, uh, you have to comply by doing X, Y, Z. So that governance framework is really important, and then the, the companion idea to all of this is a data and model factory that you always have in production, where Watson X is the engine that allows you to do right. that. And we operate one, so we create a family of models across natural language, around code, or geospatial data, et cetera. And then our clients can also operate their own data and model factory, and you can bring open source models. Another thing we're really big believers on, the pace of innovation of what is happening in the open AI community is extraordinary. Right. And, uh, and I think a myth-busting thing that we can do right away is, 
if people believe that the future is like this one company or two companies that have the magic model that right. everybody's going to use, that is going to be flat out wrong. And, in, and if you look at just what has happened in the open field, it's phenomenal of how creative people are, how quickly they compress the models and the new novel things. So we want to bring all that innovation to the client. So with this new kind of technology, okay, maybe it's three years old, right? Um, how should enterprises be looking differently at, at AI? I mean, it, it seemed to be a little bit of a bolt-on, which is, okay, I have my enterprise and we're gonna, we're gonna add it. I, I think um, you, you're referring to it as the show as AI Plus. Yep. I'm curious, how are you recommending to clients that they look at AI in this new generative, excuse me, more foundational models? If you go back to maybe 2017, AI adoption was starting, but not very material. It's now doubled in the last five years. And I think we've started the transition from companies think about, let me do my normal business, and then maybe I'll do a little AI on the yeah. side. I'll do some experiments. Sparkle. Right. There. Yes. To what I would call AI first. And I think every company now is at a, they're at a fork in the road. They have to decide, am I going to be AI first? Right. Or am I going to let my competition do that? I don't think many people want their competition to do that. So I do think there's a unique moment in time. What's different and I'd say special about this time is there is also a macro catalyst, mm. which is the focus on productivity. That's happening in every country, every industry right now. And I think the early applications for foundational models are going to be about doing more with less. It's going to be about productivity. It's not going to be betting on, can I find the next revenue growth vector? That's important, but there's a lot that can be had in terms of automating repetitive tasks, right. running your core business more effectively. So there is a, a macro driver here around productivity. Yeah, it feels like uh, every company has the opportunity to participate. I know, uh, you know, I had some conversations here, and actually I spoke to the Wall Street Journal the other day, and we were talking about, is this just a big enterprise thing? And even the word enterprises starts to change because every company can get bigger and still be smaller. Right. And that's one of the biggest probable inflections of this AI era, is that you no longer have to have the same resource volumes to hit the same revenue volumes. It's like hedge funds. You know, you can get really big with a, a very small, in other industries though. But I think that's really the question that people are asking, whether it's, you know, the industry asking, whether it's your CEOs that you're talking to asking, whether it's the media is asking is, what does this kind of mean in practicality? What is the practical process here, whether you are a 500 person company or a 50,000 person company right now, what is the practical next steps to think around AI? And Dario, I'll let you, you, you go, go first on this one. So look, one, one uh, first element that we've been highlighting is this idea of digital labor, right? And, uh, and in digital labor is we all perform many tasks uh, in, our, in our day, and there is a subset of them that have the characteristic of being well mapped to what AI can do today. Uh, they can be because of the repetitive nature, or they can be things because the access to data that they have and implementing best practices better than any individual could do. So in coding, it could be, right? right? Implementing best practices, a good example of that. So, so what, I, what it means is that as a company in, in the associated productivity, you can be more ambitious on the number of projects that you can complete uh, in time, or you, know, you can be you know, much more efficient and lower the error rate, right? For example, in like, if you think in software, it's traditional 30, 50% of the time spent on debugging. Well, could you imagine that number being half and the implications that that would have in terms of quality control? So those are all things that are, you know, sort of immediate applications. And, and I think what is happening is people are starting to see, uh, as Rob was pointed out, that it is actually possible. I mean, like the implications for what's happening in generative AI on code, it's amazing. I mean, right. if you all get to experience, it's really impressive. Like uh, you can improve 60, 70% of all the code that, that, that you write is now suggested to you and you can just hit tap and adapt it. That has really profound implications on both quality and number of products that you can actually launch and improve. So Rob, you, my guess is you're hopefully spending most of your time with clients here and they must have a lot of questions for you in, a, in the green room or the pseudo green room. I guess we have yeah. green grass here. 
Uh, we were talking a little bit about where are these conversations, because IBM offers a lot more than AI, but the conversations have been a lot about uh, AI. And, and I think that's a good reflection of what you said and how it resonated with the problems that they have. But I'm sure you're also getting the question of how do I get started? How do I, how do I put this to work, right? There's two big trends happening here. And I think to Arvin's credit, when he took over as CEO back in 2020, he charted the, the next chapter for IBM around hybrid cloud and AI. Right. And you look at where we are now on adoption of containers, I would say the acceptance, the embracing of hybrid cloud. I don't talk to any client that's just running on, on a single public cloud right. anymore. I think people have gotten comfortable with that. Yes. There's more to do. There's always more work on application modernization. How do we get price for performance across multiple cloud deployments? So that's continuing, but that's like understood at this point. AI is the topic where people are still a little bit unsure. That's why we're trying to be, bring clarity to what we think are the use cases for businesses, which is around digital labor, which Dario mentioned. The story I loved yesterday was Edward Logan, who's the CEO of Sport Clips. This shows you how this can scale up and down. Right. The fact that he's using Watson Orchestrate now to automate how they do their hiring, how they're gonna bring on 50% more stylists in the next year, I don't think anybody thought that a company like that, a franchiser right. of hairstylists, <laughs> would be an early adopter of AI. Right. But that's how accessible the technology is. So you've got this notion of digital labor, you've got IT automation, just make the jobs of the technology teams easier inside a company. Customer service, we've been going after customer service for a number of years. It right. gets better when you bring foundational models and cybersecurity. So those are, I'd say, the four broader domains where we see immediate applicability. Every company, those are relevant for. So it's not industry specific per se. That's why I think people are saying, all right, we're going to get over the hump of being unsure. Right. This is something we can actually understand and put into practice. As analysts, sometimes we have to simplify for the outside world. And what, what was simple for me was multi-cloud, multi-model. Dario, can you talk a little bit about what that is and, and why that's important? Well, <clears throat> I think a, a very nice synergistic aspect of the IBM strategy is that they build on each other. AI is an inherently distributed workload by necessity, right? Right. Because where you do training in a data center and where you do inference, which could be all the way at the edge device, exploits the properties of it has to work in a distributed environment. Right. So, so, so therefore, you inherit the value and the property of a hybrid cloud architecture. So by natively building on top of OpenShift and extending it with other open source packages, with, we've done a wonderful collaboration with Meta, with PyTorch, we've done you know, fantastic collaboration with the Ray community and others, with Hugging Face as well in terms of interfaces. So now what we're giving our clients is the AI workload itself can run everywhere and inherently it's needed. So you no longer have to engage with a client about an intellectual argument about why the benefits of running in different places is good. It's like AI runs that way. Right. So that's one property of the multi-cloud nature. And then the second one is one model will not rule them all. Multi-models, it's way better. Why? I'll give you an example. Watson Code Assistant. Watson Code Assistant, we have taken uh, and built a foundation model that now is embedded in Red Hat Ansible automation yeah. platform. That model is 35 times smaller than the equivalent co-pilot model and is higher performant. It's better, so it's cheaper to run sure. right at inference time, it's higher performing, so the reality of it is when you get down to it, using the generic technology, which is the foundation model approach, but then applying it to model specificity and use case, you deliver more value to the client. So that's what people are going to do. Yeah, uh, Rob, you brought up digital labor as an application. I think that's a really interesting one. And, and by the way, I do love that Dario brought up the smaller foundational models. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how much time you and I are probably spending. I know in my advisories, I'm spending with people trying to deal with sustainability. And the fact is, is this is a exponential moment for compute. And so when you're deploying more GPUs, more horsepower, more, more compute, more data center, and you know, companies are trying to deal with sustainability. By the way, sustainability is an application. I would love for you to just kind of run through for me 
all the applications that you're kind of seeing. You mentioned digital labor, I kind of just tease sustainability, but there's yeah. like four or five applications that I think IBM highlighted here at Think that are really practical that all enterprises could be thinking about building right on top of Watson X. Sustainability is a great one, which is as much about data as it is the application of AI. Can you actually collect data and understand how to get to carbon neutral, as, as an example? Uh, cybersecurity is a significant one. There's, there's no amount of humans that can be thrown at the cybersecurity process anymore that will solve the problem. So at this point, it is all about AI. I gave the example yesterday of Novaland, they're a real estate company that was doing a thousand manual interventions every day. That becomes impossible. Like we can't hire enough people to do this. Using AI and Watson, they've now reduced that to less than a hundred that humans actually have to look at and address. So it's just the nature of technology as it gets more complex, more penetration, you're going to have to have AI to make how we work just a lot easier. The other philosophy that's changed for us is we want to be customer number one for everything that we build. Right. And we shared the example of what we've done in our human resources where we're now getting 94% automation, what was before had to be done by an actual human. This is about making our own employees more productive, but our clients also look a lot like us, so we're confident if we get great results on IBM, then we'll get great results with clients. Yeah, I think the augmentation thing, I just want to double click on that because there's a lot of confusion, Rob, in the market. I know Arvin's words got a little twisted in an article about where he talked about the 7,800 jobs, and he was really kind of talking more about, you know, the jobs on a factory floor of yesteryear that then got replaced because robots came in, but there were still yeah. jobs managing that, and there was all kinds of new jobs that got created with every industrial revolution that came through. But you just mentioned that you know you take taken 94% of an HR process that used to be done. It's not all bad, though, and I want to make sure we point on that because a lot of it's about upskilling, right? I mean, you have to be talking to the customers about now that you've automated this, we're going to upskill the workforce, we're going to do more, solve more important problems. This is about a, a shift in work. Let me give you another example. NatWest, the financial institution, we've done a lot of work with them on automating customer service. They're now able to handle 80% with software. That doesn't mean they got rid of their customer service representatives. They shifted them to the more difficult problems. Right. So in the same time that they've done this automation, their NPS, their net promoter score, client satisfaction has gone up 20 points. It was never going to go up 20 points if they had everybody dealing with things like help me set up account, help me change my password, like really basic repetitive tasks. So this is about augmentation and ultimately it's about how do you better serve customers. By the way, I mean, you know, since you are semi, you know, uh, semiconductor backgrounds and the experience, I mean, look at what happened with electronic design automation, yeah. right? right? And, uh, and you had the designers and people were like counting each transistors and timing it around it. And then at some point there were very clever and sophisticated ideas. Imagine, imagine transistors are free. Imagine we had enough automation that you exactly. could design any product that you wanted. All of a sudden that freed up a different way to do things. So I think, I think that there are many of these, you know, so, and that was an example of not even like a, you know, a simple process. It required a huge level of skill and yet, we all said, like as an industry, says, actually we're not going to do that anymore. That is going to be handled by computers. But that didn't stop the, either That's the right. growth of the industry, the growth of the number of people that could create products with it. I think the same happens in a corporation, right? You have all these skills that you're doing and applying to different tasks. It says, actually we can do those skills better now this way. So now let's focus on doing this other one. And the history has been that we always <laughs> find new ways to tap onto talent and, and exploit it. So, so I agree. There's a lot of like twisting that happens right. around that, and Arvin point on the, you know, 40% of the people were doing agriculture, right, at 100 years yeah. ago. And I don't think we miss the fact that we're doing that and we only can do that with one and a half percent. There's still more jobs and yeah. it's still going. So I think it's going to be a similar story on this that we got to go and tackle. Yeah, and by the way, I've never met an engineer who actually yeah. liked to go at the transistor level and optimize. <laughs> it was always given to, you know, the, the folks, maybe the new people or, or something like that. And what did we see? We saw a democratization of semiconductors. There's more semiconductor IP now, probably 20-fold, than there was a few years ago because of this uh, fractalization and improvement in the processes that engineers didn't want to do anyways, right? So I think we're going to see that as well. Same discussion we had on uh, even virtualization of 
you know, it's gonna it's gonna crater, it's gonna you know reduce jobs because we don't have people do this. That just exploded the the the, the amount of, of industry uh, that was out there. By the way, the one big ding 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 bell that went off in my head, um, probably 18 months ago, I was kind of questioning why is IBM leaning into a uh, uh, hybrid cloud and AI like. Wait a second. Did, <laughs> What's the connection? Didn't these guys do this already? So the, the big thing was, first of all, uh, you saw uh, this latest foundational model uh, wave coming before it was cool, okay? One of the first companies to identify this. And the second thing is, it's very hard to do any of this generative AI foundational models uh, without having a hybrid model, which by the way, Rob, to your point, I have yet to talk to a Fortune 500 company that doesn't have more than one IaaS provider. It's, thank goodness, we're, we're like a teenager in cloud, right. right? Where we're not debating this. So, all these great things that are happening. Um, anyways, I just wanted to share that with the audience and with you. Uh, I'd like to, we've had a great strategic discussion on, on the needs, where this is coming from, how IBM is strategically approaching it, but we kind of glossed over the products <laughs> that, that you're offering. Uh, I want to go back to that. Maybe, Dario, we can start with you. Um, what were the three things that you announced? What is, uh, what is Watson X? What are the three areas and why do they matter? Yeah, so Watson X is our platform for builders of AI. And what it allows us to do is we're taking all the capabilities that we have built over yeah. many years to do machine learning and deep learning and govern the life cycle, all in there. But on top of that, natively now created to be able to do foundation models and generative AI. Watson X is composed of three elements. Okay. Watson X.AI, dot data, and dot governance. AI allows you to train, validate, and do inference on the models you create and it gives you a model family. Dot data is your data store that allows you to do you know incredibly fast querying built on all open source technology by the way I'll highlight which is incredibly important for the extension and compatibility of all of this. And governance is it allows you to do the whole life cycle management of the models themselves so right. that you know whether there is drift, whether you need to do updates, it gives you the fact sheets around the models. So that platform which by the way, it's a big deal. Like the, the only other horizontal platform that IBM was discussing was the hybrid cloud platform right. with Red Hat. We are building and we are delivering now a data and AI platform that is powers all our software products, but on top of that, for clients and our partners to build on. Love it. So Rob, uh, I just want to ask one more question before we, uh, we take off and get back to Think. By, by the way, very excited for today. It's going to be a great day too of Think. And I want to talk about the speed just a little bit because I've never seen anything move this quickly. And of course, we always say that the law of diffusion of innovation with each new thing is the period gets shorter and shorter, but this has been incredible. Right. We've seen in six months, literally companies that had AI nowhere on their radar to being the number one priority. You're seeing companies that were doing AI as an experiment saying we're all in. And even us, you know, right. as, as small enterprise owners are saying like, I'm looking at every process in my business right now and saying, whether it's an internal operational process, Rob, or even just the way we might advise a company like IBM, can I do it with generative AI? I'm asking that question. How fast do you think this goes? The conversations you're having, are your customers doubling down? Is Arvin's IT being the most protected line item going to turn into a board-focused initiative <laughs> that's going to be funded, that's going to accelerate this deflationary value that, that mm -hmm. AI has on the future of enterprise? AI has definitely become a board-level topic. Yeah. And if I think about our core business, it's probably the second thing in the last decade, or maybe the, there's been three. Cybersecurity has become a board level topic. Hybrid cloud has become a board level topic. Now AI is there. And I think it's, it's time for that. I also put this in the category though, it seems like it's happened very fast. It's actually been happening very slowly for a long time. Right. <laughs> with a lot of iteration. <laughs> and, and now the interest has spiked. Yeah. And, we were making enormous investments in training and model building when nobody really wanted to talk about it. Sure. But we do think it's what differentiates what we're doing in Watson X, which is we've already made the huge upfront investment. So clients can focus on bringing their proprietary data set, focus on inference, which is not inherently as expensive as doing training. So I think it's been a slow, constant way for quite a while. 
now there's a huge spike in interest. Now people have to figure out how are we going to do something. Exactly. Gentlemen, I can feel the excitement uh, at IBM think like I've never seen. I've been in and around IBM for 33 years. And yes, that's when I started working. Uh, and watching, I've never seen this amount of excitement. I mean, hybrid cloud is the right strategy. It's what every customer wants, hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, AI, we just talked for 30 minutes uh, about that. Oh, and let's not forget about quantum, right? Which is just around the corner as discussion uh, we had before, one to two years before we get this, to this utility uh, where you can do s more with it. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you're six five veterans, and I really appreciate uh, you doing this insider for us. Nice to see you both. Thank you for having Great us. Good to see you. Thank Thanks. you for having us. Yeah. So this is Pat and Dan at IBM Think 2023 here in Orlando doing a 6.5 Insider where we have the most relevant companies with the most important executives. We hope you love the show. Tune into some of our other IBM Think 2023 coverage here. We appreciate you, thanks so much.